world news tonight. Clock is ticking. Fear mounts for Indian workers stuck in the collapsed tunnel for over 72 hours. High stakes meeting. Chinese leader Xi Jinping arrives in the US ahead of a much anticipated APEC summit. Wage fight. Australian paramedics walk out on jobs demanding better pay. And Christmas at Q. London's Royal Botanical Gardens debut its annual Christmas Lights Show. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Tonight's top story starts in neighbouring India. The lives of 40 Indian labourers who have been trapped in a tunnel for more than 72 hours hang in the balance as authorities try to rescue them. The workers were building the tunnel in northern Uttarakhand state when a part of it caved in due to a landslide on Sunday. State and federal rescue teams have been using a massive drill to push through the debris to reach the men. Fears were mounting for 40 construction workers who have been stuck in a collapsed tunnel for more than 72 hours, as rescue efforts were hampered by fresh debris as those trapped inside began reporting illnesses. The road tunnel, which had been under construction in the mountainous state of Uttarakhand, collapsed in the early hours of Sunday after a landslide. Dozens of migrant labourers were trapped 200 metres inside as a part of the roof caved in and the tunnel entrance was blocked by concrete rubble, rocks and twisted metal. Since Sunday, a huge rescue operation has been underway involving heavy machinery with more than 200 disaster management and rescue officials and engineers working to clear the debris. More than 20 metres of rubble have been cleared, but 30 metres more need to be removed to reach the men. Local District Magistrate Abhishek Rehela told reporters that if everything goes as planned, the trap labourers would be evacuated by Wednesday. Large, three-foot-wide metal pipes were brought to the site in hopes of drilling a shaft through the debris and inserting the pipes, creating an escape passage for the workers. However, rescue efforts were set back as more rubble continued to fall and there was a fault with the drilling machinery. Oxygen and food packets containing dried chickpeas, dried fruits, almonds and puff rice have been funneled to the 40 labourers through small pipes which were inserted into the 40-metre cavity where the men are trapped. Constant contact has also been maintained through walkie-talkies to keep the labourers calm and several of family members have been able to speak briefly to those trapped. While officials said that there was enough oxygen getting into the tunnel for the men to survive for five to six days, a doctor on site said several men had started to complain of worrying symptoms including dizziness, fever and vomiting. The three-mile-long tunnel was being constructed in the district of Uttarakashi as part of the Shar Dam Road Project which aims to improve connectivity across the mountainous Himalayan state of Uttarakhand. <laughs> Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in the United States for his first visit in six years after U.S. President Joe Biden said that his goal in their bilateral talks this week was to restore normal communications with Beijing, including military-to-military -military contacts. Nine months after the spy balloon controversy sent U.S.-China relations tumbling to a new low, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping will have their work cut out as they attempt to mend diplomatic ties. In their first meeting in over a year, the two leaders will seek to restore military communications between their countries. Contacts were severed by Beijing last year following House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, a move that angered China, which has long held territorial ambitions over the island. And while Biden looks unlikely to fundamentally alter his stance on Taiwanese sovereignty, he could seek to appease Beijing by reiterating support for the status quo. The two heads of state are also expected to address ongoing wars in Ukraine and Gaza, two major conflicts where they stand on opposing sides. The U.S. hopes China can use its political leverage with Russia and Iran to prevent the crises from spiraling out of control. Economic issues will also be high on the agenda, with the countries keen to stabilize their $700 billion trade partnership. Xi Jinping is expected to meet with American business leaders after the summit, signaling a willingness to pursue fresh deals with U.S. companies. The two leaders will also hope to reinforce cooperation on global issues ranging from climate change to drug trafficking. And while they're unlikely to fully see eye to eye, any sign of stabilizing relations between the two superpowers will be seen as a positive outcome. 
Over in the U.S. now, the House of Representatives has passed a short-term funding bill in a bid to avert a government shutdown that looms on Friday, despite a major Republican revolt. The U.S. House of Representatives appears to have avoided yet another government shutdown, passing a spending bill that is expected to be approved in the Senate and signed into law by President Joe Biden. But it only postpones the issue for another few months. This was the bill passing the House on Tuesday evening. The overwhelming bipartisan vote of 336 to 95 is a victory for the new House Speaker, Republican Mike Johnson, who faced opposition from some in his own party because the bill avoids some polarizing issues like deep spending cuts and border security. 93 of the 95 no votes were Republicans against it, only two Democrats opposed. President Biden has to sign the bill by Friday to avoid shutdown. The bill extends current funding levels into the new year. Some programs like veterans benefits, transportation, housing and the FDA are now funded through January 19th. Others, including defense, expire February 2nd. Moving on to Australia next. Paramedics in New South Wales, Australia have gone on strike in a push for more resources and higher pay. Striking paramedics have denied calls to leave their own stations in order to fill roster gaps for 24 hours. Paramedics, the very first to respond at the worst of times, making life-saving decisions. Base salary in New South Wales, 79000 a year. But if Mick Grayson left his station on the coast for a new job in the ACT, an instant pay rise. An intensive care paramedic, probably about close to $40,000. In the last six months, New South Wales has lost 600 paramedics, all lured interstate. It's been 14 years of working as a paramedic in New South Wales Ambulance, and in that 14 years, I've barely seen a change in what I'm being paid, yet the skills that I provide to the community have changed drastically. So now the Health Services Union says it's going the nuclear option. Next month, one and a half thousand of our paramedics will refuse to sign up for professional registration. It means they won't be able to perform complex specialised procedures. It means that a paramedic will um, be able to turn up in an ambulance, drive the ambulance, but will not be able to undertake invasive activity. They want a 22% pay rise. We want to be recognised as professionals first of all, and what we know is to stop the bleed of you know, trained personnel from this state to others, is that we need at least parity with Queensland rates. The health minister sounds he's a long way from conceding a 22% pay hike. I know that the issue of registration uh, is looming. I know that that would have impact on our community. Paramedics say they won't be putting lives at risk, but procedures they could perform will now fall to an already overburdened hospital system. On to the updates on the Israel-Hamas war front now. Israel said that its military launched a targeted operation against Hamas inside Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering. After several days of siege, Israeli forces entered Al-Shifa, Gaza's largest hospital, on Wednesday. The IDF forces include medical teams and Arabic speakers who have undergone specified training to prepare for this complex and sensitive environment with the intent that no harm is caused to the civilians. The building had recently become the focal point of fighting in the Palestinian enclave after Israel accused Hamas of using it as a base of operations, a claim which was recently corroborated by Washington. Hamas and PIJ members operate a command and control node from Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. They have weapons stored there and are prepared to respond to an Israeli military operation against the facility. Despite repeated calls by the U.S. and the U.N. to protect the hospital, Israeli soldiers and tanks reportedly stormed the building in the early hours on Wednesday. According to local officials, some 20,000 people, including medical staff and patients, were still holed up inside the complex. The Israeli army says it called on civilians to evacuate before launching its offensive, a request that was deemed unrealistic by the World Health Organization. The people in the hospitals were very vulnerable, very sick, so moving them was uh, a, an impossible task. And you were asking doctors and nurses to move people, knowing that that would kill them. Uh, and again, 
why would you need to move them? A hospital should never be under attack. Al-Shifa was one of the few remaining functioning hospitals in the Gaza Strip. Witnesses have described horrific conditions inside, with scant food and water, doctors performing surgeries without anesthetics, and hundreds of bodies buried in mass graves or left to decompose in the open due to a lack of electricity. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Tonight's Road to the White House now. A state judge ruled that Donald Trump can appear on the ballot for the Republican primary in Michigan. A setback to challengers who argue that he is constitutionally disqualified from being president because of his actions on the 6th of January 2021. The lawsuit is one of several that left-leaning groups have filed across the country arguing that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment bars Trump from holding office. The provision says anyone who takes an oath to the United States and then engages in insurrection or rebellion against the nation cannot hold office unless Congress votes by two-third majority to allow them. The measure was adopted after civil war and has not been tested. Judge James Robert Redford of the Michigan Court of Claims ruled that in Michigan, that language does not prevent a candidate from appearing on the ballot for a party primary for the purposes of selecting a nominee. While he left the door open to a challenge, should Trump become the nominee, the suggested courts could not prevent Trump from appearing on the ballot because the core question in the matter was one for Congress and not judges. Over in the UK, now Londoners shared varied reactions to the return of ex-Prime Minister David Cameron, with some expressing surprise at his under-a-rock absence from the public eye and politics overall. It's been described as a shock return, an astonishing comeback. David Cameron's re-emergence from the political wilderness has been headline-grabbing, but for some British voters, he's far from an inspiring pick for Foreign Secretary. I think that they've run out of ideas, really, uh, and they've run out of credible people. He's been on the rock for a while. Just wonder whether or not he, go, he knows much about what's going on inside. Well, he can't do any worse than what's currently in position. Cameron says what he brings to the job is solid experience. We have some daunting challenges as a country. The conflict in the Middle East, the war in Ukraine, and, of course, <laughs> I hope that Six years as Prime Minister, 11 years leading the Conservative Party gives me some useful experience and contacts and relationships and knowledge. Some analysts are sceptical that that experience holds up. Cameron's past interventions in the Middle East are seen as failures that only fueled conflict. The so-called golden era of UK-China relations during his time in Downing Street has been dismissed by his new boss as naive. And he's the person who triggered the Brexit referendum, changing the UK's relationship not just with Europe, but with the rest of the world. The world has moved on and British policy has moved on since David Cameron was Prime Minister. He brings quite a bit of baggage into a job where he has to confront the fact that the world and British policy has changed. But it seems that for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Cameron's appointment is not about bringing new ideas. His office said the new foreign secretary would stick with the government's current approach to foreign policy. The Conservative Party is trailing far behind opposition Labour in the polls and has been beset with internal chaos. Sunak just needs a safe pair of hands to keep the Tories limping towards the next election. The South Korean government has been mulling over suspending the September 19 inter-Korean military agreement, citing North Korea's aggression. And now we're learning that some of the clauses could be suspended if North Korea launches a reconnaissance satellite, which is deemed imminent. The South Korean government is reportedly considering suspending some clauses in the September 19 inter-Korean military agreement if North Korea launches a reconnaissance satellite. Citing a senior government official, Yonhap News reported on Tuesday that a possible lifting of regulations in the CMA governing aerial reconnaissance in areas along the military demarcation line will be discussed, meaning South Korea could resume these operations that are currently prohibited within 25 kilometers from the MDL. 
An official at the Ministry of Unification also told reporters the same day that the ministry will closely monitor North Korea's moves and comprehensively review necessary measures while not specifying or clarifying what has been discussed regarding the suspension of the agreement. The official added that the ministry will closely communicate with the Ministry of National Defense, which is in charge of this issue. The comment comes amid recently appointed Defense Minister Shin Won-sik's strong remarks that the CMA severely limits South Korea's real-time monitoring capabilities in the no-fly zone of North Korean provocations. Both South and North Korea agreed in 2018 to cease hostilities on land, sea and air and establish buffer zones. The agreement prohibits unmanned aerial vehicles from being flown within 10 kilometers of the MDL in western regions and 15 kilometers in eastern areas. Regarding satellite launches, North Korea had announced that it would launch one in October, but this has been delayed. The launch would be Pyongyang's third attempt to put a reconnaissance satellite in orbit. Pundits say it's possible one could be launched around November 18th, which is the country's newly designated Missile Industry Day. Crises crossed roads in Somalia. Roads into the Somali town of Dolo have been cut off by severe flooding, raising fears of food shortages. In Somalia's Dolo district, homes are abandoned, roads have turned into rivers, and food is running out. Severe flooding, which has caused death and destruction across East Africa, has cut roads into Dolo town. Shop owner Farhan Ali Abdullah says there are no supplies coming in. We can't bring goods in by plane. There is a serious shortage of goods, fuel, food and all other things in the city. Really, we will be feeling the impact. The United Nations has described the floods in Somalia and its neighbours as a once-in-a-century event. Around 1.6 million people in Somalia could be affected, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said last week. In Dolo, some say moving around the worst-hit areas of towns and villages has become dangerous. Dolo resident Tamad Hussein Abdi fears what might be waiting beneath the surface. We cannot go to some of the places in the town because of the high level of water. We are afraid of crocodiles and other animals in the flood. Some families here have been moved to camps for internally displaced people. Others have stayed, hoping to find a way to pick up the pieces. Welcome back. The ASEAN meeting kicked off in Indonesia today. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. People in Rio de Janeiro flocked today to the sea to cool down as a Brazilian meteorology institute issued a high danger alert because of a heat wave baking the country. Ukrainian forces have secured a pivotal position on the eastern shore of the Dnipro River. A Russian delegation visited the North Korean capital Pyongyang today as the isolated state announced a new progress in its banned ballistic missile program. Novak Djokovic's winning streak was halted at 19 matches as home favourite Janik Sina was roared to a superb victory. ASEAN meeting kicked off in Jakarta today with the ongoing conflict in Myanmar and Israel amass war taking centre stage in discussions. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in London, UK, as the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew debuted its annual Christmas lights show in preparation for the festive season. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.